the center of digital enterprise. Uh, my partner and other co-director, Rob Brody, is right here. Uh, we are lucky to have Phil Williams today. And well, uh, not taking a very long introduction, Phil is an expert in blockchain. And the plan is Phil will talk about, Phil, about the blockchain and other solutions they are providing uh, at uh, Centrality from 5.30 to 6.15. And then we will open the floor for Q&A. And, uh, and then after that, uh, we'll see how it goes. Well, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Evans. Actually, um, Centrality does a lot of things, um, a lot of things, very wide range of things. And um, mobility is, uh, is one of them. And um, tonight, I'm going to be spending less time talking about blockchain and the technology behind it because I think that that's actually a little bit less interesting than some of the, um, the big forces that are happening out in the mobility space because they are what is defining how we are approaching uh, this problem, uh, putting it into a, a global context. The world is, it's, getting, it's a pretty crowded place and it's getting even more crowded. And one of the reasons we create blockchain and decentralized technologies is that as the world gets more crowded, a mindset of sharing becomes vastly more important. The question, do I believe that business and life is a zero-sum game, or do I believe that we all have a shared project that we contribute to, that we get the benefits from? And uh, if you think that's a bit of a cosmic way to start a, a business talk, well, um, we are a little bit like that. Um, we do believe that the technologies we use will make a huge difference to the way we succeed in that shared project. Mobility is a massive global market and it is serving a crucial role in society and economy. And you're probably not thinking about it day to day unless you're driving up the southern motorway, in which case you're thinking about it a lot, particularly as you're stuck in that, uh, that big traffic jam gets there every day. But the private motor car, it, it, it has a, an incredible role in our history and it's one of our greatest inventions. It's the thing that probably defined, the technology that defined the 20th century more than any other. And it's got some pretty heavy competition in that area, so it's a big claim. But it changed the experiences we can have, it changed the jobs that we get, and it changed how we design our cities and countries. It's also a pretty selfish technology. It's got amazing comfort and convenience, um, but that comfort and convenience uh, comes at a, a shared cost. And in terms of the jobs to be done, that comfort and convenience meant it ate all of the demand for private transport trips from about 1950 onwards. Um, you don't need to be a um, transport economist or even a business person to understand that. You just need to look out the window. And uh, there's a cost to our communities, of course. It, it uh, extended the distance we live from centres, so we built wider cities. Um, it led to super commuting, which led to the disintegration of some of our community connections. And people are less happy because of the car. They also have had a lot more opportunity and a lot more wealth, so all these things balance. So when we talk about the future of mobility, the spoiler here is the car isn't going anywhere. It is here to stay, but how we manage it and the roles that all the other parts of the system are going to play are what is, is really interesting. And we have to change the way that we approach mobility because we can't build our way out of gridlock. And again, you, you'll all be aware of that cities are really struggling with how they deal uh, with, with mobility and with infrastructure. So, what do we actually want from our mobility future? Well, if you ask people, they will tell you they want these things. They want options for the kinds of transport we need, for our task when we need it. They want equitable systems um, that reward lower use of shared resources, roads being one, and they're an oddity because they're very shared and we don't pay a direct cost for them. Other infrastructure does not conform to those particular telecommunications. They want their time, uh, they want it to, to be given back to them because congestion eats a lot of it and it doesn't make them happy. Uh, and we want health for our people, our cities, and our environment. 
So we're going to break this into three sections. Um, we're going to talk about a bunch of good courses here. Um, micromobility is one that you will have seen zipping around uh, the streets uh, recently. That's, uh, that's going to impact our, the way we move in cities. We're going to talk about autonomy and electrification. I'm not going to talk about that for a long time because um, you've all heard a lot about auto autonomous cars um, and you've probably um, absorbed a lot of the data on it as well. So I'll touch on, on some of it. And digital infrastructure and mass. And this is where what we're doing really comes into play. And it's the part that I'm personally passionate about and think we, it's where we can make the biggest difference at the lowest cost for the most people. A um, couple of things we won't cover. Um, I'm not going to talk much about public transport, which might be weird, um, but that is a whole realm in and of itself. It's fantastic. We need to connect with public transport. We should all do more of it. Just take that as a given, and if you think I'm ignoring it, just know I'm a huge fan. Micromobility, starting here. So what is it? Um, it's, it's not just those lime scooters that you see um, crashing into people on the sidewalks of Queen Street. Um, it's uh, urban transport and electrically powered vehicles under 500 kilos. And that includes things like LEDs and minicars. Um, we're not going to talk about those much because they're a little bit of a weird one. Um, they will have a role to play, but until they actually get out of the lanes of, of traffic, they're not going to make, it, make, a big, uh, make a big change. Uh, scooters are pretty awesome. Um, they've got a, a, a having an interesting economic impact um, that is probably the, the fastest, in fact, it, I think it, the, the data says that it is the fastest growing uh, mobility business ever in the history of transportation. What they do is they grab short across the CBD journeys that used to go to cars, taxis in particular, and um, they extend the range of walking journeys. So they actually uh, induce demand for transport services that would have otherwise been in active mode or, and, and done free, so they're actually increasing the size of their own market as well. But the big dog and the, the much less sexy uh, piece of the micromobility revolution is the e-bike. And they are going to be the real game changer because they solve for the effort barrier. Um, there's no more pushing to get up hills and you don't arrive in that sweat, which is what no one likes. Um, and it's the fastest way to get across town. Actually, statistically, and we'll, we'll look at the numbers in a minute, you can park it anywhere and it returns your time flexibility. If you've got a commute at the moment that forces you onto the Auckland Harbour Bridge, you have to leave at 5.30 to come in from God knows where, um, you can get that, that time flexibility back. So a few caveats there. Um, Micromobility isn't suitable for all types of journeys. Cars do a, an interesting a fantastic job because they're so general purpose they get us there in any conditions. But we'll talk about some of those caveats as we look at the data. So that's the proposition. And there are three factors that we need to think about uh, when we try and analyse what actual impact micromobility will have. Um, they're the obvious ones. At the distance um, and the job we want micro to do, the speed and the time it's going to take, and of course the cost. And a quick nod to um, Horace Edu and uh, New Zealand's own Oliver Bruce, who do the micromobility podcast. Uh, this data is there, so let's break it down. Um, starting with distance. Um, the, this is US data for private car trips, and apologies, it's pretty hard to read, but when we look at, at all of the data for uh, travel, for private travel, it, it, it invariably conforms to a log normal distribution. All of the trips are pushed up into the short trip zone, and that's not surprising at all. We all spend more time going down to the supermarket than we do driving to, to Wellington. Uh, so many of the car miles we take could be taken on, the, on an e-bike. Um, in fact, about half of them. Um, Horace likes to break it down at the 15-mile mark. I'd, I'd pull it up back a little further and say 15k is probably a, a more realistic uh, target range. Um, but about half of these trips that people take, and this is a, a big, big, big US data set are under that, that mark. So you can see that the distance factor, once you get on an e-bike, is, is not going to be an issue. And if we look at other modes, we won't be able to see much of that, but um, the average of subway bus, other transport in US and UK data, the median is within regular biking range. So to put another way, any of those modes, if you, if you chop it all down the middle, that still comes within the range of a standard bike, let alone an e-bike. So distance is not going to be the issue. 
speed, speed comparison. So some great data from New York where they've got a ton of information about how fast things move on urban surfaces. Um, this is the question, can I get there at the time that's workable? And, and that's one of the two big things, of course being the other one, that's stopping people from getting on bikes at the moment. Um, New York City, taxi on a two mile trip, moves to seven kilometers an hour. It's slow as, and if you've tried to take a taxi from Shortland Street to the Viaduct at five o'clock, you've had a similar experience, probably slower. Um, a New York City bike, just a push bike, goes 13 kilometers per hour. A, uh, an e-bike can go 30 kilometers an hour, um, but let's just say for argument's sake that you could get 20 out of it if you had some lanes. Uh, so in dense urban environments, no surprise at all that bikes are faster than cars. And just taking those two distance and time things and putting them together in our local context, we can start to see how much of Auckland is opened up when you start talking about electric bikes. Um, that's what the equation looks like. The dotted line is out at 20 uh, kilometer travel mark. That's an hour each way if you, a lot of people already drive that. Uh, and the, the, more importantly, the 10 kilometer uh, line there is a, is a 30 minute each way, which is a, a, a no brainer. So if you're on an e-bike, you can get there in, in under half an hour. And that would rely on us having more lanes to do that in our context. And, and this is a challenge for cities around the world is how much should they take away? You know, what, what should they change in terms of the surface usage to get people uh, onto these modes? We're not joined up yet. It, it, there's some great plans that Bike Auckland have done, uh, and they're working with the NZTA and um, AT to, uh, to cons consistently improve that. So the last one, if we're going to get people switching on to, on to micromobility, is, is it going to be cheaper? And the answer is, well, absolutely it is. Um, the graph here again shows purchase services in New York, so this is not uh, private cost of ownership stuff, although we can infer. Um, the first mile in a taxi costs 12 bucks. Uh, on a shared knowledge of bike, it's a dollar. On an e-bike, it's three dollars, and that's going to keep falling. For privately owned vehicles, there'll be no competition. Uh, you've got a 50 cent deduction per mile um, there uh, for a car, and it'll be cents for, a, for a, a, an e-bike. And the market, you know, the, so okay, so that's great. We've got these, we've, we've got these new tools. We've got the option for people to use them in cities. I think we can plan for them. Um, but are we actually going to get a market driving this? And the answer is yes, because the, the market is so big. Um, if we look at the, the revenue buckets associated with travel in the US, again, these are Horace's big numbers, and, and he's being quite optimistic. He's saying that below 15, uh, 15 miles is 1.4 trillion. Now that's right on, but micro mobility can't address all of those rights. So let's just have it and say that um, we, uh, you know, that, that that's trips that are done in the rain or at night or other places. And it, you know, we, we still have over a five hundred billion dollar market. We could have it again and say, well, actually, there's whole geographies that are cities that are really hot in the summer or covered in snow in the winter, and we'd still have a, a three hundred billion dollar market. Say. So, just the sheer numbers mean that, that this is going to be big. So, a little bit of a summary for this section: uh, cost per mile is low; it's going to get lower. It's going through the floor. The market is huge, and it's going to eat a bunch of the dollars that we, we all spend on cars at the moment, and we, we spend a lot. Um, the electrification of bikes solves the two biggest barriers, which is for the, the effort and the speed, uh, and it all adds up to a big opportunity to reduce congestion. Autonomy and electrification. This is our second theme. These two forces bundle together, and they are kind of acting in tandem at the moment with cars. Um, they, they were, this, this, this car world that we have, um, these are going to be the, the two big things that are, that are coming up. So electrification um, can help uh, decarbonise our transport fleet, and that would be a, a very, very big uh, win. And autonomy does a ton of things. Um, Again, this will be familiar to most of you. It's going to make, it, make safer roads and, and give us our time back. But, and there is a bit of a but here, um, there will be big downsides to these technologies, particularly autonomy. Electrification doesn't have a lot of downsides, provided we you know, 
make our electricity with wind and solar, not coal. Um, but if they're, un if they're not managed, uh, these two forces could make, autonomous electric vehicles could make life in our cities very, very difficult. And um, to describe that a little bit, I'm going to play a short video um, from a very smart woman called Robin Chase, who's the CEO of Zipcar. Um, and she sums this up so well that I thought uh, I'd just let her do it. So hopefully this will play with sound. But it hasn't. Oh dear, this is where we sh we really should have checked, shouldn't we? I don't know that we'll be able to get it out. Um, let's try that. Self-driving cars could make cities more livable, sustainable, equitable, and just. Fully automated self-driving cars will be available for sale in cities by 2020. They have very different economics than our current cars, and so won't fit in well with today's rules of play. I see two distinct possibilities for our automated car future, heaven or hell. We get to choose. Forward-thinking leadership is going to make all the difference. We get hell by taking a wait-and-see approach. In this future, people buy AVs instead of today's cars. For trips, once you get to your destination, instead of paying for parking downtown, it'll be cheaper to have your empty AV circle the block or drive back home. The same is true for stores. It could be cheaper to have a drugstore car drive to customers than to pay for retail space downtown. Today, 75% of all cars on the road have one occupant, the driver. In the future, as we add more cars operating with their different economics, 50% of the cars will have no people in them running low-value errands or avoiding parking. Meanwhile, all the taxi, bus, shuttle, and truck drivers will lose their jobs. We'll also lose about 60% of our tax revenue that finances road infrastructure because AVs are electric, don't park, and don't get parking tickets. Our roads and bridges get a whole lot worse. We definitely don't want the hell scenario. We get heaven by taking a proactive approach. Over a million people in U.S. cities are already car sharing. And in San Francisco, 50% of the people using ride-hailing apps now share their trips with another passenger who's a stranger. Instead of spending $9,000 a year on your own car, when we combine car sharing and ride-hailing and buy a seat in a shared autonomous vehicle, we can get door-to-door -door transport at the speed of private car travel for the cost of a subway ticket. This transforms people's access to opportunity. Car sharing eliminates the need for parking. Ride-sharing reduces congestion. We will only need 10% of the cars we have in cities today, even at peak times. No more on-street parking, no more parking garages. If most of the AVs in cities are shared cars in which people can share trips, we can... I'm going to cut her off there. The rest of the video is, is great, but um, it uh, digresses into what she'd like to see for the cities, and I just want to focus it back on what the, um, the actual mobility equation is. Worth a note there, saying that this is all thinking about personal mobility. This is not uh, the, not the freight that we move. Freight is actually going to be its its own beast, and autonomy and electrification are, are going to have an easier time in that market for many reasons because the the person is not at the centre of the equation. So a lot in that in that summary from Robin there, but the. The 2020 thing that she talks about needs a little bit of expansion. So yes, we'll have autonomous electric vehicles on the road in 2020, um, but the more important question is when are we going to feel the main impact from that? And the answer comes from a couple of different forces which are described here. The electrification side of things really is dependent on battery price. Uh, I think the current price of a Tesla Model 3 battery is about $190 per kilowatt hour, and it needs to get down into that um, blue band, this is kind of $175, $160 range for it to be cheaper than a uh, petrol car at construction. And so that's going to happen uh, by about 2025. And then, of course, it's going to take a little bit of time for that to really flow out into the market. So you've got um, our friends at JP Morgan there have said that most new sales will be electric by 2030. And at the same time, you've got autonomy coming along. Autonomy is a little easier because it relies mostly on software, and a lot of the technology that we have uh, to <coughs> provide autonomy in cars is actually 
not hard tech. It's combinations of existing tech that have been bundled together. So that's not a hard rate limit, and not like, not like battery density is. So we're going to get autonomy, particularly in, in this is Pew Research saying, uh, they, uh, they polled everyone who's working in the field, and they, everyone was like, okay, average of the guesses was 2027. So again, we're, we're talking about this 2030 time for when we really are going to see the big impacts from these, uh, these two trends. So again, talking about private vehicles, everyone's going to want an autonomous electric car because it solves all of your personal transport problems um, with the existing infrastructure without asking you to change your behaviour. Call this the Mike Hosking effect. Um, we'd like to think there's only one of them, but there are, in fact, there's a little bit of Mike Hosking in all of us. We all like to jump in our car uh, at, at a convenient time. Um, and it doesn't just come down to behaviour change from individuals either. It also, we have to think about behaviour change for automakers because they've got these very big engines that are set up to produce and sell cars uh, to individuals. And they're not going to, while there are big types in the market that are starting to emerge, you've got Toyota and Uber, you've got a number of other OEM car manufacturers with rideshare, that's going to take a bit of time. So individuals are, are really not ready to give up the freedom of their private car, um, and our political systems are not brave enough to mandate it at the moment. It's hard to pass a brave policy early when you don't have a whole lot of data and we're still measuring basic things about how we use roads. Um, and that's uh, something we need to improve dramatically. And in fact, we'll start getting into that when we talk about what we're doing. So we need to set a path to this shared fleet vision um, that works for cities without stepping too hard on private rights. So zooming out a little, there's two big problems uh, and a couple of issues here which we want to sort of dig in a little bit and see how AUVs um, affect or will be affected or can affect them. So when we're talking about dealing with single occupancy, at the moment we, we deal with that with buses and trains and we also deal that, with that privately with uh, T2 lanes, um, high occupancy vehicle lanes. With cycling called peaks, um, we use uh, congestion pricing, but legacy congestion pricing is a very, very blunt tool, um, and we don't even have it in New Zealand, so um, that one's not helping us out much already. Um, we need better solutions for that. And both of these problems could be made worse by autonomy, again, because of that personal behaviour thing. We're not necessarily going to get a, a, a benefit to either of these. So, solution side, Sharing and pooling AUVs solves for occupancy. Um, there's cause for optimism here. Um, this is a, a, a chart which was published in The Economist. Um, it's from Morgan Stanley, um, saying that by 2030, around 16% of our fleet is going to be, uh, the total on-road fleet is going to be shared vehicles. Now, that's a good start, but it really needs to be shared shared, which is shared and pooled, not just uh, shared available, like an Uber fleet is at the moment. And because um, we live in a market society, uh, sharing needs to be cheaper and more convenient than running a, a vehicle in an urban area for it to, to really uh, get going. Uh, and there's a, a further downside here, which is that convenience is, is negatively impacted um, by uh, private traffic and the additional traffic that sharing generates. And New York is experiencing this right now. Um, they've just put a cap on the number of Ubers a bit late in the game, but um, they've already reckoned that there's been a measurable slowdown in, in traffic speeds in New York as a result of the number of uh, shared cars, uh, Uber, specifically Ubers, because I think there's some crazy number like 100,000 or more operating in New York City at the moment. Um, if we want sharing to work, uh, we need to prioritise uh, road space for shared and pooled vehicles. Um, at the moment, you know, mentioned before the high occupancy vehicle lanes as one solution. The, the bad news is the data shows that they don't work. They are great if you already were getting into a car with your significant other or your friend from around the corner because you wanted to. So you get there faster, but they don't actually pull anyone, get anyone to go around, knock on the door, and, and say, hey, you know, I'd like to go get there faster. They don't change behavior. So 
The good news, though, is that uh, shared fleets in Poland can go hand in hand um, because uh, behavior, behaviorally, you're much more likely to accept a pooled ride or be into sharing your car with a stranger if it's not your car in the first place. And that makes sense, right? Like if you've ordered an Uber pool or a Lyft line or one of these other pool services in the, in the US, you're expecting someone else to be picked up, not having to make a decision about how oh, do I drive around the person's house and, and grab the stranger. And that psychological change is crucial and it's the biggest reason why we should start altering our infrastructure or preferencing infrastructure to support our shared car service models. Uh, and we need to ensure that shared vehicles actually do pull uh, and we, for that, we need digital infrastructure. Looking at that second issue, um, pricing. Better pricing is the best solution for smoothing peaks. Um, pricing incentives, uh, incentivizes people to have that conversation about whether they can be flexible uh, with their work time or change their travel plans. Um, and it needs to account for these things here. Some are super easy, um, like the time that we're traveling. Um, some are less easy local road conditions, what's actually happening on the ground at the moment. And this is something the cities are really interested in. And it sounds quite simple. You know, hey, you've got red lines on Google, right? So it must be kind of easy. But it's actually really hard, and it's really, really data intensive. And we don't have good systems at the moment to, to make act, to take action based on it. And the last one is occupancy. Like, how do you price occupancy? How do you toll for two or three people in a car? How do you toll a, a car with a SIM driver more than one with four people in it. That's impossible currently, but we can do it with better digital infrastructure. And while this is a really hard problem, it's also a big opportunity because cities and societies don't solve hard problems unless they've got a real pointy stick that is prodding them. And we've got a pointy stick because we're going to lose all our fuel revenue, all our tax revenue by about 2040. So. Um, yeah, there's going to have to be some legislation and, and there's nothing like losing a ton of tax money that will get politicians off their backsides. And again, yeah, gantries aren't going to get us there. It's got to be a digital uh, solution for that one. So a bit of a summary. If we do nothing, we probably get Robin's hell scenario. That would be pretty stink because then we wouldn't get all our streets back and get to turn them into parks. That sounds kind of cool. Um, and if we do these things by, the, by 2030, we have a good shot um, and other scenario, and it really all hinges on the digital infrastructure piece. So, which leads to the, the last uh, segment here. And if you haven't taken a poll yet, I think that's the last time it will show up. So, quickly take a take a take a shot of take a photo of it so you can write it down and then I can, can roll on. Mm -hmm. um, digital infrastructure. Uh, so, what we're talking about when we say that. Um, these are the systems we need to create to manage our changing mobility environment. Mobility as a service is the concept that rather than owning cars, we'll be able to purchase a subscription based on our mobility needs. And that, that dream of an end-to-end -end transport as a service is, um, is pretty cool. Like, you live in Devonport, uh, you want to get to work but at the top of Queen Street. Um, one click, choose where you need to go and a, a shared car comes around and picks you up, delivers you to the ferry, you've got the same ticket, you walk onto the ferry, um, and uh, while you're on the ferry, the, the clouds part, because this is Auckland, four seasons in one day, and it says, it ha was going to have a car pick you up at the other end, but instead it says, actually, would you like to swap that out for a scooter ride? It would save yourself two bucks. So, of course, I like hunt scooters, so I choose that option. So, end-to-end, -end, seamless journey on multiple modes and you, you might have a subscription for that. But what we're going to talk about here mostly is the digital infrastructure. So if we get that right, then that actually is what enables those mobility as a service solutions at the moment. Very hard to stitch together without a good digital. So any of you who have worked commercially in or studied um, big uh, technology uh, industries of any sort know that, that uh, um, that market federated systems are tough. If we rely on existing market players and, and mobility to write software that talks to each other and take a hands-off approach and just say, hey, well, you know, there's some standards over there, you'll need to interoperate um, and share data, uh, it doesn't work. It's 
Well, it works really, really badly. Um, it's, it's slow, it's prone to rorts, and it combines the worst uh, parts of, um, of uh, uh, corporate monopoly defense with the um, hand sitting of government. And if ever you needed a, an example of a bad federated market, uh, for data, it's in healthcare, uh, which in the US is in total crisis. And in New Zealand, even getting your data from GP to the hospital is terrible. So if we think it's going to work in mobility, um, we're mistaken. In a federated, market federated approach, um, privacy is a major, major concern. There are data uh, silos everywhere. There are multiple copies of individual's data with every uh, federated provider. Um, so there's, the possibility for breaches is huge. One of the other features we might end up with is the private monopoly scenario. Um, this is what Uber wants to be. Um, they've been quite open about the fact that they would like to just bundle up your public transport and, you know, Dara's going to give you your uh, your end-to-end uh, -end smooth trip that I just described, and wouldn't that be wonderful? They've even uh, gone around in some US towns and started these pilots where they said, hey, we just closed down your bus system, guys. We, seriously, we've got this, we've got this. We just send out uh, Ubers and we'll, we'll set up shuttles so they don't pilots like that at the moment. That's going to end badly. It's going to end really badly. Um, privacy is, is concerning in this one in a different way. Um, it might be more secure, ironically, in, in one central place. At least the security uh, consultants will be great. They'll, I'm sure they'll be highly paid. Um, but we're beholden to another data big moth like Facebook and Google, Google, Google. And I think we've, we're learning a little bit about the fact that we don't want those particular types of data monopolies. And right now, we're kind of on track from the, the data and, and digital infrastructure uh, direction for, a, for a, a, a shady hybrid of these first two, I, I would say. That would be the most likely outcome on current policy settings. Um, but there is a third option that we should aim for, um, and that's an open network, open system that respects regulation. Um, it's not run by governments, um, because they, they don't, they're not typically good at running uh, big digital systems for their citizens. Um, but it needs to be started and supported by government, uh, and particularly by cities who have the most to gain and the biggest problems to solve. And the important thing about um, an open network uh, is that the network effect is shared, and that is, is going to be a game changer for us. So thankfully, we at Centrality are not alone in this thinking. Um, very smart woman up here. Uh, Celia Reynolds. Um, she is a very, very influential transport uh, planner um, from LA, and you've read them, so I, I won't repeat them in full. But basically, she's saying, "Hey, we we've got to do this on a on a at the speed of, of digital. We can't do it at the speed of concrete." And she also believes that we need um, a Linux operating system for city mobility. She wants to see you know 100 cities around the world. Uh, using the kind of open platform that we are proposing and to, uh, to all share from each other's um, uh, experiences and benefit. Um, and that's a great vision because uh, newsflash, cities uh, are broke. A lot of cities are really, really broke. Um, ours are not too bad. It's somewhere in the middle, although Auckland is not going to be throwing a lot of money at uh, this sort of stuff uh, in the near future. Uh, most US cities are broke, some are bankrupt. Um, Europe's in much better shape, they've typically got a bit of money to spend, and then you've got your outperformers like China and, and Singapore and well, big cities in China, um, who, in, in Dubai and UAE, UA, you can spend whatever they like, um, but, but generally if you, want a, if you want a big solution and you want that to be um, broadly accepted um, across large parts of the world, you're going to have to do something that's cost effective. So, Another issue with federated markets um, is that the private market is hugely fragmented um, in mobility services, and that's for everyone that's not Uber. So in Barcelona, which is where our partner, Biomob, who's developing the, the protocol that we're working on, are based, there are 52 different mobility apps, uh, and you didn't have to have a different app installed on your phone for every one. And Competition is good, um, but that's not the right kind of competition. The kind of competition you want is where you compete for, on, on price, on service, on a, on a good quality, not on just network acquisition and load building. 
that's actually everyone doing the same work over and over again. And you can't easily connect them together for mass services. You've got to go around stitching up individual deals, which again, you know, leads to leads to the survival of the first and, and only the big, big players would survive. So what does this um, this uh, mythical open mobility network look like? Well, it looks a little bit like this. There's two pieces of software that primarily that we, we absolutely have to have to, to create this kind of this kind of system. Uh, one is um, a hub, mobility a, a hub that takes all of the inventory that you find in the city, whether that's public transport or private uh, a pro a private mobility operators and eventually private cars. And they all are tested into this city hub and the they're available, uh, broadcast their availability in there and they can be, be pulled together into a service by an application layer. And so the second the second piece of open source software that, that we're building is, an, uh, is, a, is a white label app. And that's like a, a, a super uber app that actually takes all um, of the, the modal transport and there's not actually a, a really good multimodal uh, front-end application out there in, in the market at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but we will build one and a system like that this has to be open sourced. So cities who have their own transit app at the moment, maybe have the AT app on, on your phone, Portland could pick it up, Los Angeles could pick it up, and they could just, just take that app and rebrand it, and those services could be offered free. As with any good tech marketplace, because the, the top layer, the app layer, is open source, there's competition at that, at that level, and that's competing um, at the app and the service level, not at the network level, with, that, with all that duplication that goes along with it. So what do we get out of it? Well, we get that, uh, that, that the ability to create those end-to-end -end genes on multiple loads, our car to our ferry to our scooter. Um, and we can offer citizens rewards for walking, cycling, and public transport, because we want to incentivize behaviors that aren't car-based, rather than simply penalizing cars. Um, we can also connect private vehicles who want to carpool. So there's a really interesting um, product that Waze uh, have launched in the US now, which is Waze, of course, originally a wayfinding app. It was quite by Google, but that originally a wayfinding app. But when you now put your car journey in, um, it knows where you're going. And then if other Waze users are on there and say, I want to go from A to B, it, it kind of turns you into an Uber. So, do you want a car pull along this journey? And it's crucial that there is one system here for both uh, commercial, public, not, not, tr not freight services, but commercial um, individual services, and for private car driving. And the reason for that is that roads are a network, and networks um, work, uh, only work very well when they're all interconnected. There's a few, a few math rules about that, but um, that would be um, a little a little over my own head, so I won't try and go there. To get broad buy-in for an open system, um, we do, however, need to address individual privacy. Because when people see a chart that says, hey, you know, we're going to have my taxi broadcasting into a city hub, we're going to have my car talking to that as well, immediately they're going, oh, I don't want anyone to know where, where I'm going. That's, that's very sensitive. And there are a, a lot of reasons why I might want that, that known. So what we need to do, and one of the, the really cool things that blockchain can do, is we can start to do uh, self-sovereign identity. And what that means is for any individual who is operating in this kind of system, who is driving a taxi or running a private vehicle, that they have their own uh, ID, and it's not in a centralized database, that's data stored on users' phones, uh, can be optionally backed up. Uh, in a distributed cloud uh, with an encrypted key, so no one can, there's not a central uh, data store that can be hacked, and every key is different. And most importantly, it doesn't send data. So at the moment, an API asks, when, when, if, if you're asking a traditional API you know, for, a, uh, for a copy of someone's 
data, like a drug license number or whatever, they'd send you that number and then you maybe check it back against it. So you, you get that piece of data from the, um, the user, get that drug license number, and then you go off to the LPNZ API and you'd say, hey, is that valid? Now, all of a sudden you've got a copy of that data and there's just no way around that. You have to have it if you want to if you want to call off the third party API to check it. What this kind of decentralized setup allows is it, it, you can ask questions. So you've got some information over point A and then you, you're actually just saying, hey, does this person have a valid current driver's license? And the answer comes back yes or no. Um, one of the um, one of the uh, examples we use is um, is entry to a bar. Um, it's, it's the classic one. You have to prove your age, um, but your ID has a ton of other information on it, and you know the bouncer doesn't necessarily need to see all of that. He just needs to know whether you're over 18 to, to get into the bar. And this is the digit, becomes the digital equivalent of that. So this starts to become quite crucial in mobility systems because systems like this need a lot of proofs to operate. You know, does the car have a registration? Does the driver own the car? <laughs> does the driver have a license? There are quite a few things that, uh, that you need to understand. So decentralized identities can help um, be, they can be a great solution to those concerns about privacy where there's, where there's a lot of data. So you have this open mobility network in your city paired with a decentralized private ID. And what that can do is start to return value to the city and its citizens. So if mobility data is mined, say to improve autonomous AI, they should get a dividend. At the moment, all of that returns to Google or to Facebook or whoever's doing that, uh, doing that mining. And even more simply, cities just need to have uh, access to fair data on everything that moves on a road in order to improve services. They don't need to know who, but they do need to know what is moving around, and they shouldn't need a court order to get it. At the moment, the behaviour of the um, monopoly operators in mobility is pretty poor. Um, they give up data only where it's legislated to do so, and in an open ecosystem, you, you wouldn't need that. You just get summarised and anonymised data that cities can use to make good decisions. Open source. So you want software that doesn't have a long uh, overhead to cities and nations. They can support the start, and they set the rules. This is with cities, not around cities. And a decentralized market runs the network. It's blockchain. I was trying to see how long I could go without saying that. <laughs> um, and an open market allows trustless con contracts. You can sell your customer a right and receive a commission without a punction agreement. Um, just a smart contract. So this enables some interesting new, new use cases. Um, you could bundle travel uh, with a booking. Um, this is already done in closed systems, like when you um, buy a plane ticket here in New Zealand offers you a taxi. Um, and that's just an agreement that they've stitched up with the provider or they've got their own fleet or whatever. Um, but an open network, that functionality can be ubiquitous. I've um, booked a family pass to Auckland Museum and at the time of booking, I might want to pre-book pre -book a, a taxi van that's going to take my whole phone over down there. Or if I made a restaurant booking, maybe I don't want to choose that at the time. I mean, if it's a nice night, I might want to walk, but maybe an hour beforehand, I'd get a pen saying, hey, um, here's a couple of travel options for you. And you wouldn't need any um, commercial agreements to do that because it's part of an open marketplace that can be negotiated through smart contracts. Offloading demand, uh, this is a big one for mobility operators to work with each other. Um, at the moment, if the weight on your preferred service is slow, um, tough, you're out of luck. So if Uber is not able to get to you and, and that's the only app you have on your phone, too bad. Um, but customers don't really care too much about brand, with, with certain exceptions. For the most part, they want to, uh, they want a short weight and they want to get there with a, a reasonable amount of quality. And so an open marketplace, in an, in an open mobility marketplace, one provider can on-sell that demand to another provider and receive a commission for that, again, without any contract. So there's a properly open market, and you know, maybe that's 50 cents for a dollar. So the, the acquiring 
uh, business is rewarded for the brand work that they've done and the loyalty that they've established by getting the app onto the user's phone. Um, but the, the end delivery, the, the benefit or the profit is split between the, the, them and the company that actually uh, delivers. And lastly, usage fees um, based on carpool. And this is a, a holy grail. Um, you can actually confirm through a hub with privacy whether a, a shared or private car is carrying more than one passenger and charge accordingly. And when you say this to transport planners, they're like, their minds are blown because that is exactly what they want to do. Essentially, they like, and at the moment, they do that by putting everyone in the bus because they know that, that that carries a lot of people. But what we really want is the flexibility of car movement um, with some sharing uh, in what we do, and that means carpooling, um, and we can do all that without uh, revealing um, too much. So, a roadmap for New Zealand. 6.15, I'm pretty much out of time, aren't I? You can take yeah. 10 more minutes. Okay, great. I won't talk through through all of this then, but there's a couple of key things. We've got this, we've got a pretty limited time, and there are kind of three phases we go through. And the first one is we've got to start setting up um, for our digital infrastructure. So we need to start piloting these open source uh, city hubs. Um, we're actually talking, uh, I'm, I'm off to Portland tonight to talk to them about whether they're going to do a pilot in 2019 for the technology that, that we're developing. And then once you've got a, a bit of that commercial traffic in, you start using those data sets to inform policy. Um, we know that our city leaders uh, want data. It helps leverage them off their seats. <laughs> Same with central government. And so once you've got some of that digital infrastructure in place, you go into the, the middle zone here, which is um, where you, you start getting the, all the commercial, um, the for hire traffic, um, attesting through hubs. And uh, you can even start having EVs and, and that commercial traffic pay uh, road charges via the hubs um, as part of that transition. And eventually, you say all new vehicles need to attest into the hubs, and that's actually quite a way to go down the track, so the technology's proven out by that point. And it's only once you've gone six, seven, eight years down the journey that you actually start to deploy the stick, which is uh, we have to mandate that all vehicles need to be retrofitted to talk into the hubs. But we have to do something along those lines anyway, because we need, um, uh, we need to uh, replace fuel charging with um, road charging, and there's just no way around that. So again, turn, turn that thread into an opportunity. And why this will work is that it never says you can't own a car. It doesn't say, hey, we've, we've all got to just have these shared police rolling around the city. Um, you can still buy a car. Uh, it's just going to be part of, a, of the network, part of the system. And it uses smart pricing and prioritization as mechanisms uh, for control. So that's. That's the guts of it. We need to change our rules. Uh, we need legislation that preempts the autonomous electric vehicle way. We need to use price as a mechanism to manage a single driver private car congestion. Say that three times fast. We need to drive behaviour change towards shared services. City planning is part of that. We need to incentivise mobility as a service, possibly with a contestable fund. We need to close parts of the city to private non full traffic. We need to open more bike lanes for micromobility. We need to ensure our digital infrastructure is open source. Sounds ambitious, but with great challenge comes great opportunity. And uh, I believe that we can do this one together. Um, so hopefully we can get on and do it. Any questions? Do we have a few minutes for questions? So Auckland's going to Light Vale, which is of course an older technology. Um, on the one hand, it moves lots of people. On the other hand, it feels like maybe you would be able to do better. But you have an opinion? I think it's fantastic. Right, absolutely in, in favour. Trunk lines are, are just uh, a city's lifeblood, and the the um, the kind of uh, of role that AEDs will. will um, uh, will fill in this transition mode, especially, is to actually start connecting people to trunks. So what you can do is rationalise bus lines into super bus lines that are super fast and then have AEVs actually serving people up to the bus lines because 
what people hate about transfers at the moment is that it, they have to wait so long for the next pass. And even on a high frequency route, uh, anywhere in the world, that could be five to 10 minutes. If that time is down to two minutes because it's a super line um, or something like light rail, then um, you've got a, a real uh, great conclusion. Um, in terms of electrification, what about the sort of limitations of lithium? Is that going to be a problem? It's a tough one. Smarter people than I are working on it. I really hope they get it right. <laughs> yeah. Are there some more radical things sort of lurking around? For instance, I remember I was in Italy and they had escalators to take us up, up the hill and things like that. And so are there some people thinking outside the square? You know, you've sort of got the, all the conventional sort Do you of want flying cars, Rod? Right? Yeah. Do you want, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love to... Uh, so there, there will always be, I think, there will be roles for, for other kind of... Uh, non-standard, non-ground transportation. But the bulk of us are going to continue to move uh, on roads with something that looks like roads, roads or rails. Um, I love talking about flying cars because they do make me laugh. Um, they're like the, the galleons of old. They, um, you have to have an extremely wealthy patron in order to get to where you're going. Um, basically, they, yeah, they're, they're going to be so expensive and so annoying that um, we won't ever see them go into, into huge uptake. Um, if, uh, if anyone's ever read the story of um, the um, sonic boom tests over Kansas City, uh, you just there's a great podcast on it. Just just um, just Google it. Um, that will give you some insight into the level of pushback we'll have uh, on the noise from from flying cars. They're going to be an outside urban thing. Privacy. Um, you did suggest that you know, blockchain could solve it. Uh, my thoughts were like self sovereign identity. You could have multiple identities for one mode of transport, so an identity for the driver, an identity for the vehicle, and possibly something else as well. So, like, you know, how do you solve that kind of a scenario? So, if I understand the question, Correctly, you're asking how are we dealing with the identities of everything in the network, not just the people. Yeah, so, so essentially, yeah. like, you know, the yeah. driver may not be owning the car. So you Correct. Like, yeah, so great. I totally get it. Yes, it's already sold. So there are three types of, of, uh, of entity within, um, within the self sovereign identity system. Um, they are people, um, they are organizations, so a company or a, or a system yeah. itself, um, and an asset. And each one of those can have relationships in the And that would also mean that across the ecosystem, that IDs should be in the databases. So, like, you know, essentially, New Zealand Transport should have all those IDs. Well, they wouldn't necessarily need to have them all. There would be some databases that covered specific things that had a regulatory or a system functional need. But the cool thing about sovereign identities is that, that, that they don't all have to be in one place, only for, for checking so them, be legal things. And it still wouldn't be in, in this system. It would be a separate government database. Uh, together with that, there has to be an agreement on the route as well, because somewhere in between, because of maybe there is a jam or something else, and um, then like one of these passengers, they decide to take a different route, then what happens? Because that has to be another, like, that's an element in the entire journey. So, sorry, the question is, like, um, like in addition to the identities, mm -hmm. like the agreement on taking a certain route, that oh. would become a part of managing that entire journey? Yeah, you're saying if you had to change where you were going, the way you were getting to somewhere because of traffic condition, for example? Could be. Yeah, I think you could dy dynamically that. Yeah, but then if they are more than, like, it's not a single user, there are a couple of users, so there has yep. to be a certain level of agreement between those four things. Yeah. Like, the, adding to the complexity of the entire equation, because there are a couple of moving parts here. Yeah, yeah. I, I see what you're getting at. Um, so there are some pretty, um, pretty 
easily, easy to define parameters about how willing a, an occupant in a shared vehicle is to diverge off their most direct path to pick someone else up. And the, the, all the data shows us that they are actually willing to go quite a, a way out of their path, provided they never turn around. If they start going back, the behavior just changes completely. So you can get away with quite a few side streets, but you can, you can never turn around. Uh, yeah, it's a really cool project, and it's probably the future that we all would like it to be, but don't you feel like it relies on just so many political factors that are probably outside of your control? Like, just imagine that you said that there should be like bus lanes and like we should double bike lanes. Imagine if the government proposes it and then next day you open the herald or stuff and like there will be a shit storm for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, like what we see now is council with government, they kind of backing up or just not doing anything, like when there are conflicts yeah, like I, that. I totally understand. So, you're, you're right, the, to achieve that vision, that roadmap that I set out for New Zealand would take a really, a, a lot of people and a lot of energy and a lot of steps, and certainly not stuff that we're doing. But there's that vision, which I think is a great goal for us. And then there is our project, and the actual the hub and the, the open source software that we're building around that hub can can succeed to a number of levels, and the bar for its initial success is quite low. What we need is the support of cities to get it installed, and if they put their public transport inventory into it, which they have no reason not to, the cities that we speak with are universally supportive because they want open source software they want multi-model model routing to, to connect with their public transport. Then everything else, if everything else was left to the private market, we would still get a situation where every other mobility provider who's not Uber or Lyft would benefit from being in that network. If you already have a massive network, you don't benefit a lot from it. But what you'd find is you'd have the top half of the market with a couple of companies, and then everyone else. And that, that everyone else would actually connect super well with PT, so over time, if city, cities go, come on Uber, you have to actually get in there. And we're dealing with cities with a range of views on that. <coughs> Some of them, like Singapore, are a little more that free market approach. We're not going to, we'll give you our PT, public trans transit inventory, but everything else is up to you. Portland, a little different. Extremely progressive transit authority there. The woman, Viviana McHugh, who runs their innovation uh, has been there for 10 years, uh, originally did co-developed the general transit fee specification uh, along with the good people at Google. They, Portland, have already gone around and, and they have agreements with all of the major shared mobility providers in their city saying, hey, you have to put, or you, you will put your inventory into our open trip planner. That's a piece of software that they have developed um, which is just a, a routing piece of software. It doesn't sell you a ticket, it's got no contracts between it. So they will re aggregate it their um, ecosystem. And what they're saying to us is, okay, cool, we've done that. And you, you, you can provide software which would take that to a more commercial level. So it can succeed uh, just, just with a base install in the city, or it can succeed with the city's full support. And then there's another level, which is in, if you get national support for the approach, which would only come out of a couple of successful pilots in cities, then the networks can connect together between cities. I have a quick question. So what you're saying is that in this case, you are saying that the participants can cooperate and then they can compete as well. Correct. So they have to cooperate. So you are saying this is a better market compared to open free market competition. Is that what you're saying? It's a it's a um, evolution of uh, of that competition. Um, there would be instances in which you might not want to put your inventory into that market. Um, I think cities will will toe a line between saying to providers, yes, you have to put all your inventory in there, and you have to be party to the open contracts. What they might say is, you just have to attest so that we have your mobility data. But if you want to run your uh, your own network, that's fine. 
But again, what you get is that the first um, scenario that I described where the PT inventory in a city connected really well with the small participants who were all gave a huge benefit from that network effect. And then you had bigger operators like Uber who wouldn't sign up in the first instance. And what that is going to mean that over time there'll be benefit even to big operators. So it can work off a low base. The reason I was asking is that, the follow-up question is, so I look at, like, you know, again, in the market. So for example, you're proposing an open digital market and uh, infrastructure, actually, where many partners can, for example, join in, right? So think of, for example, maybe Kevin here is, like, you know, he runs main freight. So there are a lot of, like, you know, supply chain operators. So you're thinking of maybe developing infrastructure for supply chain operators, and so all, many people might join in. So the question is whether they have benefit in joining in such an infrastructure so you're talking about sharing demand or offloading demand and so other things. So whether such a system can be developed for these different sectors as well. Absolutely. That's what you might. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, but freight logistics is quite a different beast to human logistics, um, which is why I, when I saw Kevin was here, I carefully sort of <laughs> sidestepped that one. Um, we've, uh, we've actually, we're doing a little bit of work in, in that area, um, and not not in the same type of open marketplace, uh, but we've got a product called Trackback um, that is looking at uh, at, at uh, logistics. There are a couple of um, of open marketplaces for uh, freight boarding uh, already. You'll be familiar with them. Um, there are some blockchain-based uh, solutions for that, so I think we will see we'll see that in time. Um, it's a it's a if the two ever became the same thing, I'd be surprised, but they have some <laughs> fundamental principles that are similar. With regards to the solution as well, if, if your hope is with regards to PT, yep. creating the critical mass, do you think without the last mile, we would be a, like an attractive proposition for the end user? You mean, would it be worth having the, an, an open hub even without the last mile providers being yep. involved in that? Uh, it, it could still still work uh, well because it could provide, it's possible that it could provide a um, better uh, purchasing for routing and purchasing solution than many cities existing PT technology. In fact, <laughs> the bar's pretty low on some of those, so the answer is yes. I mean, AT's uh, routing now is starting to get pretty good. It's still not what I'd, I'd say is right up there in the top quarter. Um, but there are so many cities who are in the dust. So even if they took the white label, ran the hub, and just put their put their badge on it, their their public transit would, would the benefit to public transport riders would be there from day one. But we'd like to see some scooters on the end of that as well. That'd be great. Sorry, there's one more question. Um, just just wondering, what's your opinion about it? Because um, if you go to another country like America or Australia, uh, the Uber Pool and the Lyft are very big services. Yeah. Uh, a lot of users are using those every day. Um, yeah. And in New Zealand, we don't really have the service. Um, do you think that we are a step behind um, in other countries to like, start this sharing? I think we might. Um, you've just reminded me that we, we all did this poll, and I haven't actually um, popped it up to see um, see what we got, because this had some connections. Oh, no. I'm going to have to jump onto my phone now, aren't I? Uh, here we go. I think um, I think Kiwis will find will struggle with that in the first instance. Um, we're not Europeans yet, <laughs> although we might aspire to. Um, let's have a let's have a look down here at what people said about your question. Thank you about carpooling. 11 out of 11 people answered that, and 64% 60, 60 of you said you'd happily share your car commute with other people. So admittedly, this room might have a bit of a skew, but I'm heartened by, by that result. Um, just run through these uh, so that you can see what everyone else answered. Um, E-bikes, most of you have never tried one, and no one owns one. <laughs> that, is, that is a shame. I, if I'd answered that, I've, I've just ordered one from Belgium. Um, it's it's coming in after Christmas. Uh, it's called a cowboy, mm. and I'll send you the link, Kevin. They are 
red dot designer will look amazing. Yeah, fantastic. Um, regarding e-scooters, I have half of you have never tried one, um, but nearly half have, have uh, ridden one, and 10% of you own one. That's cool. Nice. That's one person. That's one person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who, who is that? Do you want? You don't have to. Be, it, uh, nice. <laughs> what, what sort do you want? Um, just waiting for it now. Yeah. Uh, that is Xiaomi. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the one that's that bird you use, right? M3? Yeah, that's a good, good one. My relationship with Uber. <laughs> yeah, not surprised at all. No one has never used it, and most people only use it, yeah. Um, I gave a, uh, a much briefer talk at the NZ Taxi Federation conference a month or two ago, and um, there were some sad faces in that room. <laughs> but we should play Zooming. Yeah, we absolutely should. And... Um, and we actually have a, a product called Ushare as well, which is, um, des has been designed specifically to digitise legacy taxi fleets because so many of them are struggling with, uh, with their user experience. Thinking about electric cars, most have never driven one. Um, there are a few, few of you there who have driven someone else's, me too. Um, a, uh, a buddy of mine has a Tesla and drove that a little bit. Uh, and one of you owns or is seriously considering and lucky last there, thinking about autonomous cars and sharing. Um, oh, we talked about that, didn't we? Yep, yeah. we're, 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 we're through it. We're done. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. <laughs>